Two investigations are underway over whether cadets and midshipmen flashed a white power sign on live TV. They were seen making the OK sign behind a reporter before Saturday's Army-Navy game. The gesture has been adopted by white supremacists to signify a W and a P for white power. White people will not be saving black people. In fact, white people are not even thinking about black people. Do you know who white people are thinking about? They're thinking about white people. They're thinking about their husbands, their wives, their children, their neighborhoods, their businesses, their schools first. In Success Runs in Our Race, which I wrote 25 years ago, I begged our people to think race and culture first, but not only. Right? Right? We are not the stereotype of the uh, sagging pants, hip hopper, calling out people niggas, bitches, and hoes. We ain't that. We must learn, we must earn, and we must return. We have a lot of us learning, a lot of us earning, but not enough of us returning. Radio, DJ, One Nation, One Station. Hey guys, you're listening to the voice of Valerie Denise Jones. This is the YouTube version of Friday's live broadcast featuring Dr. Frazier. Guys, I am so excited to present this to you because when I tell you Dr. Frazier did the darn thing on Friday, I tell you, you are just, I don't know what to say. I All I know is that you need three things right now, a non-alcoholic libation, pen, and paper because you're going to take a slew of notes. Take those notes, guys, and meet me down in the comments section. All right, here we go. This is George. You're Hello. talking to me? Hey, how, how, are, how you? are you, Valerie? I missed my cue. Yeah. I'm doing wonderful. Good to hear your voice. This show is sponsored by MyOliveLeaf.biz, MyOliveLeaf.biz. And top of the food chain films at Black, White, and Blue Film.com. Again, that's Black, White, and Blue Film.com. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to jump right into the interview for the sake of time. So the very first thing I want you to do is please introduce yourself to our listening audience and also tell me, us, <laughs> if there's a difference between Dr. Frazier and Frazier Net. Well, Frazier Net and Dr. George Frazier is actually, actually one and the same thing. Um, Fraser Net is a manifestation of that which um, uh, fulfills my purpose, the, the reason that God has sent me here, because God does not do his work in the sky, he does his work through you. And so if we were to put some words or define Fraser Net, it's a global leadership network um, to aggregate um, top black professionals, business owners, uh, uh, and ultimately community resources to increase opportunities for people of African descent. That's why I was sent here. That's why it's named after me, Fraser Net or Fraser Networking. And if, if, I'm, if I'm a brand, if, if just say that I'm a brand, at 75 years old, I probably would be best known by, by those who know me as the brother that brought the whole idea of networking to top of mind uh, in the African-American community. I wrote a book some 25 years ago called Success Runs in Our Race, The Complete Guide to Effective Networking in the African-American Community. It is a modern-day classic. It is required reading in 57 historically black colleges. It is the book that defined networking for us and, 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 and basically started the networking movement. And I, I say that with humility. And I have been preaching, evangelizing, teaching, instructing, in inspiring, motivating our people around the power and importance of the relationships in our lives. That is critical and key to me, and I think it should be critical and key to any brother and sister uh, out here who wants to succeed in life. So what I write about and what I speak about and what I act on comes out of my own personal manifestation, my own personal experiences, my own personal actions and deeds. I don't pontificate ad nauseum about our issues. I really understand what the challenges are in, in the black community. I'm at 75 years old, 
I, I should. I'm a race man. I've been committed to black people uh, and the service uh, of, uh, of black people uh, for 40 years. And a race man or a race woman is someone who has made a moral and spiritual, uh, strategic and tactical commitment uh, to invest their time, talent, and treasure into the upliftment of his or her own people first. I operate by a very simple philosophy of which I have been teaching and preaching and writing about and conferencing about and doing seminars and workshops and trainings about. It's a very simple three-word philosophy for our people, which is a reflection of me, and I say that with humility. We must learn, we must earn, and we must return. We have a lot of us learning, a lot of us earning, but not enough of us returning. And therein lies the huge 21st century challenge that black people have. And so I want to say the next thing and still be loved, that white people will not be saving black people. In fact, white people are not even thinking about black people. Do you know who white people are thinking about? They're thinking about white people. They're thinking about their husbands, their wives, their children, their neighborhoods, their businesses, their schools first. In Success Runs in Our Race, which I wrote 25 years ago, I begged our people to think race and culture first, but not only. Let me repeat that. To think race and culture first, but not only. That your time, talent, and treasure needs to be coalesced and reinvested first back into you because you can't teach what you don't know, you can't give what you don't have, and then second into the upliftment of our people, that we must get there and then we must reach down and lift up and reach back and pull forward and we must never forget from whence we came because we are all drinking from wells that we did not dig and we owe we have a debt to pay we are standing on the shoulders of giants i am where i am today because of the work that was done before me not the work that i did the baton was passed to my generation i'm a baby boomer and i am preparing to pass the baton to the millennials gen x's and gen y's hopefully better and that's who I am. That's what I live for. That's what I will die for. Uh, that is what gives me, George Fraser, the greatest fulfillment, the greatest joy, and the greatest satisfaction. And that is why God put me here. Dr. Frazier, I see now that Joshua Brown is on the line, so I don't want to hold him too long. But I do have a question uh, regarding wealth building. Now, I noticed in your resume that you filed for bankruptcy and also you had a few lower level jobs. I am real big on the habits of wealthy people. And I just wanted to know if you think that the process of acquiring financial independence is different when you acquired it versus now. And also, can you give us a few nuggets to grow on? Uh is there a difference in terms of my trajectory and what it took for me to get to where I am uh, now than when I was in my, let's say, heyday? And by the way, my heyday uh, was between uh, 60 and 70. That's my heyday. That's a whole other thing. Um, uh, I have, and I've said this publicly, and by the way, I wrote about my bankruptcy in my first book 25 years ago, Success Runs in Our Race, as an object lesson. Uh, and, I, and I admit fully from the stage that I have failed my way to success, that I embrace failure, that I eat obstacles as vitamins, because I've learned over time that it is through our mistakes, our stumbles, our falls, our failures, that we learn. This is how God has designed the system. You learn a hell of a lot more through failure than you do through success. And so the biggest failure I had in my 75 years of life is when I 
initially started my business after I pivoted out of the public and private sector. I was down the path to my 33-year business and seven years in because in spite of all of the wonderful jobs I had at Procter & Gamble, United Way, and Ford Motor Company, I learned how to make sales, metaphorically speaking, but I did not learn how to make profit. Two different things. They don't really teach you how to make profit when you are an employee. They teach you how to do a job and to sell stuff. And I was one of those. But when you go into business, you must learn how to make a profit. And so um, I was very good at selling what I was producing, um, but not very good at understanding the fine detail on how to make a profit, right? And essentially, I went into bankruptcy because I tried to grow too fast. I had some wonderful products and services. I made lots and lots of money very fast. Um, and then I said, man, if I could make this much money on this thing in one year, in one city, what if I take this same thing to seven cities simultaneously next year? Wrong. First things first. Second thing's never. Do the first thing, do it with excellence, and then the second thing becomes the first thing. Don't get greedy. Be patient. Learn along the way and stumble. So I stumbled, right? Uh, I outgrew my ability to service financially and literally service uh, the business that I was doing, which ultimately put me into bankruptcy, both business bankruptcy and personal bankruptcy, because back in the day, banks were not certainly given black people in, quote, business loans. No, they would give you loans against your assets, and you could use it for business if you so decide. But that's what they were, they were loaning, you know, based on the value of your assets. And that's what I got loans on to help to expand and grow my business, of which I mismanaged because I was naive and did not understand and did not have the proper coaches and mentors, entrepreneurial, who looked like me around me at that time. But that failure, the biggest of my business career, basically taught me almost everything I needed to know. Uh, to climb the highest mountain. That failure alone, and again, I'm not bragging here, put me into multimillionaire status. Right? All the lessons I extracted from that failure, which I saw as an obstacle. So I'll conclude with this thought. My favorite quote outside of the Bible my favorite quote of the Bible is Proverbs 13.22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. That's my favorite quote in the Bible. But outside of the Bible is a quote by Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius, emperor Marcus Aurelius, said this in 160 AD. Marcus Aurelius was a Stoic, and he followed the Stoic philosophy. Um, he was one of the five great Caesars. Marcus Aurelius said that the impediment to action advances the action. What stands in the way becomes the way. Now, let me say it differently. The obstacle is the way. Where there is no obstacle, there is no way. If the mountain was smooth, you couldn't climb it. Obstacles are the way. 
What is the first thing God does when he gives you an assignment that he feels that you are ready for? He puts an obstacle in your way. And your job is to find a way over, around, through, or under the obstacle. And when you do, you get an attaboy and an girl, and then God gives you a new assignment at a slightly higher level. And then what is the next thing God does? He puts an obstacle in your way. And when we look back over our lives, anyone that's listening to this, this is exactly what your life has played out to be. The question becomes, what obstacles did you overcome? And what did you learn from those obstacles? And how did you apply those obstacles to your advancement in life and the fulfillment of your purpose. James Baldwin says it beautifully. He says, we are born, we suffer, and then we die. What does he mean by that? He means it is the way that you manage your suffering because you will suffer. There are no exceptions to the rule. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, was crucified. He suffered. You will suffer. The question is, how do you manage that suffering? What do you get from that suffering that moves your life and enriches your life, right? And the the better you do that, the more fulfilling your life is. In fact, that will in essence determine your heaven or hell. So, That is my lesson for today. Obstacles are good. Eat them as I do as vitamins. This is where you're going to learn your lessons. And you are not alone. If you look at the trajectory of Africans in America from being dragged here in in chains and stuffed into the hulls of slave ships. We talk about an obstacle. Oh, that's an obstacle. We suffered through that for 250 years and then another 100 years of Jim Crow to get where we are today. That's an obstacle. We learn from those that suffering and that pain And now we are the most educated and professionally trained generation of Africans in the history of the world. There are no black people in the entire world doing better than we are. And I've been every place that black people have been dispersed. South Africa, Central Africa, East Africa, West Africa, North Africa, all over South America, and all over the Caribbean. In fact, if you think about it, we are the beacon of hope for every single person of African descent In the entire world, God works in mysterious ways. Oh, wow, Dr. Frazier, that was a beautiful answer. I appreciate you so much. Okay, so at this time, I am going to open up the judge's mic. Three, two, three. There's some nasty feedback. I'm not sure which mic it's coming from. But if we can figure that out um, so that we can make sure that... Yeah. Um, Dr. Frazier, do you have background noise? No, no. I mean, I heard a little something, something, but but it wasn't disturbing. But, uh, no, I can hear the judge clearly. And I want to say to the judge before he winds up and and throws me the pitch here, and I know it's going to be a fastball. Uh, I just want to say to you, judge, I love you. I have followed you. I admire you. I love your straight, no chase to take on things. I have learned a lot from you. Listening to you is like sitting at the feet of a master. So, um, so however you feel uh, about me, and, and I, I love you for that, and I appreciate it. But know that it is reciprocal. Yeah, well, I'm not going to come at you too hard. It's just like, tell us about a book or movie that changed <laughs> And one of them that you have down here is Emotional Intelligence 2.0. I have noticed that there is a trend nationally and within our particular community to focus more on feelings, belief, and your emotions more so than on logic, rationality, reason, and analysis. Uh, do you notice that is a fundamental problem these days, or is that just something that 
dust is always slightly under the surface, or has it gotten worse or better? What do you think about that? I, I, I think that the emotion. Uh, I'm a big fan of emotional intelligence, and certainly, we emotional intelligence is the management of our five most important emotions, and then using the management of those emotions to cultivate, nurture, and to build relationships at work, at home, and in the community. Community, but we can say that. From my perspective, Charge, that is icing on the cake. It ain't necessarily the cake, right? But I think reason and logic and intellect and, 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 and the depth of your thinking and how you manage that and how you build on that over your entire life vis-a-vis -vis personal growth and development, constant never-ending improvement, and lifelong learning. That's the cake. EQ is icing on the cake, right? But EQ, without what you just stated and I just stated, is, is an empty vessel. Certainly, we don't want to have the personality of a box of rocks. Um, and I've met people who are brilliant but have the personality of the, of the box of rocks. We don't want to have the personality of a box of rocks. Um, and I've met people who are brilliant, but have the personality of the, of the box of rocks. And, and, and it's very difficult for them to cultivate, nurture, and to build relationships, to build teams, to lead. I, I think that, that aside from Barack Obama being brilliant, Harvard, uh, president of Harvard Law Review, and leapfrogging all those who thought they should be president before him and, and, and that he did not have enough experience. Let me tell you what he had, in addition to brilliance, is he had a very high EQ. And the way he managed, and I, I, in the early stages I worked with him, this guy was unbelievable in how he coalesced his resources, how he inspired people, how he engaged people, that people worked hard for him because they liked him. Not only was he smart, but they liked him. And so I think EQ has its place uh, on the sage, but it will not replace Logic, reason, philosophy, deep thought, understanding how the world works. It's not going to replace that, right? Um, so so th that's my take on it. Okay, I'll give you a remark, and then I want you to answer another question. You talked about Barack Obama. What, in your opinion, are the things that he has done for the country and for the people? I think, number one, that a black man, brilliant, handsome, with one of the baddest sisters on the planet, leader of the free world, sitting in the White House, comporting, articulating, speaking, modeling um, the strength of a black man, I think that alone, for me, the all eight years that he was president, in spite of the fact that he has a, he had the house against him and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? That alone, made, in my 75 years, was the most fulfilling presidency for me as a black man and modeling for other black children and especially black men. That, for me, was number one. Now, we could, there would be a long conversation about legislation, its focus uh, as it relates to a black economic agenda, and lots of conversation about that. I don't think he is good, he's going to go down in history uh, as a, um, uh, a Lyndon Bain, Johnson type savvy politician that's able to get things done. I don't I don't think he's not he's not gonna be that kind or Franklin Roosevelt type who would who passed a 
lot of legislation, very good with his people skills and his politics. I don't know that he will go down in history as that. But for me, um, he made me feel proud. Uh, he helped to raise the race esteem uh, and the self-esteem of black people. We're still talking about him to this day. Um, I think had it been another time, perhaps had he been a little bit older, more political experience and political cronies, because that's what it takes, because passing legislation is a big part of our cronyism. It's about, you know, who your friends are, uh, what positions they occupy in, the, in, in this house of power. Um, but for a newcomer, relatively speaking, uh, and, and I can't say it enough, the, the most proud I have felt in my 75 years as a black man in a racist country, and America is still racist, right, the most proud I have felt was the eight years he was in office. And to see him uh, give speeches, I mean, powerful, eloquent talks, um, the way he, uh, he behaved, the way his wife comported, the whole family was just a model of black excellence. That made me feel good. In terms of what the millennials and the Generation X are calling tangibles, um, I know his Treasury Secretary Geithner drafted and lobbied strongly for the Economic Incentive Act, which I think is the still the largest singular appropriation bill in the history of the country. Is there any other significant uh, legislation sure. that he pushed? What? Yeah, yeah. Well, well of course, there's Obamacare. <laughs> well, right? no, I happen to know something about that. This is written by what was then senior Tennessee Republican U.S. Senator Dr. Bill Frist, whose family started Blue Cross. He drafted what is known as Obamacare in 2003 when he was Republican Senate Majority Leader. He did mm -hmm. that. That was seven years old when it got passed, and that wasn't in the Obama administration. It's labeled Obamacare, but I'm just saying legislation that his administration drafted, then is anything else familiar to you? I've been trying to think on it. I can't really come up with any. But no, 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 me. no. But, but he got it. Now, whoever drafted it, I'm sure that that uh, President Obama did not draft it. I don't, I don't think he had no, that I think nobody in his administration did. It was a Republican head of the Senate majority mm -hmm. leader, Bill Fisk. But it was really a model of what Romney uh, had uh, uh, implemented in, 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 in Massachusetts. Actually, it was before that. Uh, if you read the bill, I don't want to get sidetracked in it, but I'm a type 2 diabetic, and i got to get all this medication. And there's got all too. kinds of quirks in it, like a few – I've got one – Medication, if you get a 30-day supply, there's a $474 copay. If you get a 90-day supply, the entire copay is only $17. <laughs> and then things that go around on that, and it just doesn't make any sense until you read yeah. the fine print. But aside from that, yeah. your, your position, it would be, is that he served as an exemplar for black, black folk to develop pride and respect for. Is that basically yeah, pride and respect and to pursue excellence, to be excellent at what you do, right? To pursue, he was an example yeah. of excellence and family. All right. I've got people that ask me all the time, so well, what did he have to do with us since he has no black relatives in America? How does he equate to being one of us? What did he have to do with us since he has no black relatives in America? How does he equate to being one of us? That's the question I get a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've gotten... His father was African, as you know, Nigerian. 
And, and no, um, Kenyon, Kenyon, Kenyon. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not Nigerian. You're right, Kenyon. That, that, that's exactly right. I'm, Other I'm, side I'm, of the he, was he, was he was Kenyan. He was not Nigerian. Yeah, that's correct. Um, um, and I, I think that um, that's all I could claim uh, in, in terms of uh, if we're looking at uh, um, African Americanness. Um, the fact that he he was raised in America, although raised by his white grandparents, um, I still think that he and it is written in his in his book uh, in search for his father and and he searched for himself and um, when he met Michelle and their family and lived in Chicago and sat in the pews of Jeremiah Wright. There was some orientation that, that was of course some controversy at, at the, at, at the end before he was elected president. But, um, no, I, 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 I can't say that he was a full blooded enculturated African American. No, no. He looked well, black. I mean, Right, he he, he how sounded that, black. How does that connect with us? How does that connect with us? It's like that's like somebody like Marcus Garvey came from the Caribbean. Jamaica. We identify uh -huh. with him. Okay, and by the way, uh, we have a, a guest, uh, Doctor Short. You might know him. Uh, went to school as an undergrad with uh, the president, and he indicates that that individual, uh, I think he's the one, and I, I've, I can back him up on that. The first time that the president set foot in on continent, continental U.S. soil, continental, it was when he enrolled in college. He'd been in Hawaii, but he had never been in continental United States before he right. went to college. Right. Mm -hmm. and grew up right. mostly in Indonesia and Hawaii back and forth. Uh, but I'm just saying, I, I get your point about the ideation. What is the impact when we get so deep off into appearances rather than to into, into performance? Um, in other words, in our generation, somebody in the 60s would have said, he talks a good game, but what does he do? That he talks a good game, but what does he do? Mm -hmm. Well, he got elected president of the free world. I think that's monumental. Um, he, provo he provided moral guidance. Uh, he helped. Uh, I mean, it, would be, it would be go back to, and it might not be the best example, is, you know, the Bill Cosby show. All right? That was a television show. But what did it really do? It showed the black family in a different light. A working father who was a professional, a working mother who was a professional, beautiful children, and, and, the, and the resolution of problems in the black family other than the stereotypes that we see. All right? So I think, in a sense, uh, metaphorically speaking, that, uh, uh, President Obama and Michelle, even to this day, represent the qualities that are superb and excellent. And I want to believe, maybe this is just me personally, Judge, I want to believe that this is who we really are. Right? Right? We are not the stereotype of the uh, sagging pants hip hopper calling out people niggas, bitches, and hoes calling out people niggas, bitches, and hoes. We ain't that. But that's what you see. So would I rather see Michelle and Barack and get the feeling that I get from them and what, how they comport themselves and what they represent? Or would I rather see what, what America would rather put on radio and television? Right? Gold teeth, gold chains, niggas, bitches, and hoes. Gold teeth, gold chains, niggas, bitches, and hoes. Well, I think I'd take, I'd take Barack and Michelle.
<clears throat> Let me ask you another question. On your questionnaire, you said something about what are the top three bad habits you would like to see us change, in other words, black people, over the next generation. I think those well, are some interesting subjects, and I agree with you. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think we have some bad habits around a, a particular addiction, this is how I characterize it, and that is that we were addicted to instant gratification versus delayed gratification, right? And this has driven the economic engine of black America. Um, uh, let me say that differently. Uh, the goal for black people is to win, not to look like we're winning. I would rather carry a plastic bag with $5,000 in it than to carry a $5,000 Louis Vuitton bag with $100 in it. I would rather carry a plastic bag with $5,000 in it than to carry a $5,000 Louis Vuitton bag with $100 in it, right? So you ain't winning. Louis Vuitton is winning. Gucci is winning. Nike is winning. I, I tell black people all the time, if you drive in a, a Land Rover and you have a landlord, you're stupid. But, we have esteem issues. In many cases, we are out of our minds, right? Um, and we understand that we have gone through a psychological holocaust second to none in the history of humankind. So to assuage those esteem issues, we put on stuff that says we are somebody. I, I tell black people all the time, if you drive in a, a Land Rover and you have a landlord, you're stupid, right? But this is this is uh, this is this is not a good thing. Sort of faking it till you make it. So that's that's an addiction that I think we need to um, fix. Right uh, to help close the income and wealth gap between blacks and whites in America, because that that's as big as it's ever been. Um, in fact, it was an interesting article on the front page of USA Today that stated, "Judge, well, it was about African American baby boomers on the front page." So that African-American baby boomers will be the first generation of Africans in America to raise another generation of Africans in America that will not do better than them. So in the 400-year history of our people in this country, we are the only generation to raise another generation that will be worse off. That needs to be fixed, right? Yes, I agree with second, you. 100% on that one. Yeah, yeah absolutely. The, 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 the 100% on that one. God bless you. I appreciate that. Uh, the second... Let me, let me throw uh, one other thing at you while you're on. I'm not asking you to interrupt it, but if you would also address this issue that we baby boomers uh, tried to address back in the 60s... Uh, I'm black and I'm proud to deal with black self-hate. I personally am of the opinion that it has fallen down over the last 50 years, glorification of dysfunction, et cetera, the things you mentioned about knowing everything about the NBA and Atlanta housewives, et cetera. But to me, it kind of has the flavor of the late 50s, early 60s in terms of where black people are uh, relative to their own opinion of self these days, particularly with the use of the B and H words, the N word, and uh, sagged and bagged, and the things that we seem to find entertaining or sustaining. Uh, so if you could throw that in the mix that you're answering. Sorry for the interruption. We had a little audio problem there. Um, I grew up with Dr. King in one ear, Malcolm X in the other ear, and Smokey Robinson and Marvin Gaye writing the lyrics for my music instead of Little Wayne, right? Have you ever compared the lyrics of Little Wayne to Smokey Robinson? Yeah. There is no comparison. There is no comparison. I grew up when Gil Scott Heron no, no. said the revolution would not be televised. When James Brown wrote the iconic song, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, and everybody was partying to that versus some of the music that people are partying, denigrate. Um, our women, uh, our being, 
um, and 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 we listen to this to the to the beat of 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 of, of, of a funky rhythm, all right? So um, the, these are different times, with different influences, a different focus, and I don't think, generally speaking, it has been healthy for a significant number of our people. I, I just that's just my now I'm OG or just old school. Um, and I think the whole notion of eldership, the whole notion of uh, respect and, and discipline, because this is what you know I grew up under, uh, it was discipline and obedience. You did what you were told, you were obedient, you showed respect for your elders. Uh, much of that moral fabric has been torn or ripped to shreds uh, incrementally over time. Right? It's been very subtle very nuanced but now as we look back over it judge especially coming from whence we came you can see clearly um what has happened um but it was difficult to identify it uh, as it was slowly but surely happening over a 50-year period of time i think part of that uh was part of the and I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but I think part of that was intentional. Um, and I think we've read and heard and seen a lot that could support some of the intentionality of that in terms of the destruction of the black community and things that even the government did, right, to, 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 to minimize uh, impact. Uh, of, of where we were going and, and how we wanted to get there, threatened by the Black Panthers or movements that might uh, uh, give the government a black eye. So that's that's a whole historical uh, 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 patina and a whole historical uh, sort of um, uh, underpinnings around where we have landed, Judge, at this moment in time. So I think we have to go back to the future. I mean, certainly that's what I talk about. That's what I am doing, um, putting together systems for financial education in the, in the faith-based community, uh, putting together programs and conferences and seminars around the power and importance of relationships and effective networking and connecting the dots. So there, and there are a handful of us out here on the road every day, not only evangelizing and speaking it, but actually putting together vessels, instruments, tools, venues, workshops um, uh, to, 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 to bring those uh, along. Now, I'm out here 40 years, right? I'm 75. I've been in service of our people about 40 years, and I've come to a new conclusion about our people. All right, I am a student of black people. I read 100 books a year, not bragging, just saying I'm a student of our people. I have spoken over 2,000 times around the country and around the world to black people, 8.5 million frequent flyer miles, and here is my conclusion about our people. I call it the 85-10-4-1 rule. 85-10-4-1 rule. 85% of black people... 85% of black people are sleepwalking through life. 10% are pimping the sleepwalkers. 4% have pulled themselves out of that dark, sunken place and are ready to see the light. 1% are the light, and they're ready to help the 4% get woke. So let's do the math on that, Judge. If 4% are ready, and there are 49 million black people in America, that's almost 2 million people. If 1% are the light and ready to help 4% get woke, that's about 500,000 people. So based on my best calculation of the best and brightest, the ones with the highest potential, the ones who are conscious and woke, right, about 2.5 million of us in round numbers, right, they will lead the rest of our people to the promised land. Those are the ones that I am focused on. Right? That's what I'm focused on. And, and throughout history, Judge, it has always been a few that have led the masses to the promised land. It's never going to be everybody. It never has been everybody. 
So we focus on those who see it as we see it, who want what we want, right, who are demonstrating action, not just conversation, and, and they're out there. And we will, we will help fix this because it's broken. For us, it's broken. For them, it has always been for them. Uh, this is a white world, and even to this day, uh, the economics of every place that Europeans have been, whether it was the colonialization of Africa or the Caribbean uh, uh, or the enslavement of black people in America, every place they have been, um, slaves have been freed, uh, countries have been decolonialized, but the economic power, the money, still is in the hands of whites. It's still in the hands of whites, right? You go to any place in Africa, it's still mostly they have the political power and whites still control the economics. So we have to focus on, and when Dr. King started talking about economics, you notice he was killed, right? Because that was his next big thing beyond civil rights, voting rights, public access, fair housing, was to talk about the disparity in economics, the disparity existed then. It has already always existed. It exists now. The question is, what are we going to do to fix that? That's the question. And the first thing is to become financially literate because we are a financially illiterate people as evidence in how we spend our money, who we spend our money with, the lack of recycling of our own dollars. Um, so, so it all begins with education. And that's going to take to close that gap, uh, which is as wide as it's ever been. And in the last 50 years, Judge, it has gotten wider. To, to close this gap will take 100 years. It's going to take three to five more generations before we can have any significant progress in closing the, the wealth and economic gap. And so that is really what I'm focused on with about two and a half million people. Uh, and I think that if we stay the course, uh, we have charted this course, that, that over time this will get done. But it will take time. We have to be patient, and we have to be obedient, and we have to be disciplined. Now, this is all easy to say, extraordinarily difficult to do. Uh, in fact, it was Dr. Amos Wilson who said that the only way things will change for black people in America is if we act as a nation. So that is why we went, after 33 years, from Fraser Net, 1.2 million people in our digital platform, black people in our digital platform, to Fraser Nation. We went from a membership-based um, movement to a citizen-based movement. And if anybody wants to know about Fraser Nation, which we launched at our big conference in June, our 19th conference, 19th year, um, they can just go to onefrasernation.com. But we have a lot of work to do. We need all voices, progressive voices that we can get. You're one of those voices. We need the elders to be elders. We need to reteach our young people about the concept of eldership and the respect for those elders of which you and I, which demanded of you and I when we were when we were young. Um, and we need to teach, and we need to pass the baton. And we and, and and so these are all things that I know I'm seeing to the choir. You know these already. I've heard you talk about them. Um, how will it happen, Doctor Fraser? Well, it will happen simply using the way that black people learn. We learn differently. We're all visual, tactile, kinesthetic, and auditory learners. And the key to learning really, if you really want to get down to it, is simplicity and repetition. You've got to make it as simple as you possibly can, and you've got to keep repeating it, repeating it, repeating it, repeating it, over and over because this is an intergenerational goal and objective. It is not some uh, program. It is a process. We didn't get this way overnight. We're not going to solve it overnight. So we need all hands on deck who see it, who understand it, who can contribute to it, and all voices. You're one of those voices. I mean, you're very learned, um, and 
you are analytical, uh, philosophical, uh, a great legal mind, and you speak a truth to power. So that that voice is still, I don't, I don't know what your age is. You might be about my age, but it's I'm about old. your age. There you go. I'm about, so, we're about the same age. There you go. So all, all my only advice to you, Judge, is just keep doing what you're doing. Keep saying what you're saying. And you even have, the I think, permission to be a curmudgeon. Because sometimes I'm a curmudgeon, right? Sometimes I just don't want to hear it. I'm just going to speak my truth. And whether people like it or not, uh, because I'm doing, I'm not just talking, right? I'm not just uh, you know, writing books and philosophizing. I'm out here uh, in the vineyard doing the work where the work needs to be done. And applying tourniquets where tourniquets need to be applied, uh, doing heart surgery <laughs> wherever I can, uh, replacing limbs if that's what is required. And um, we need more uh, in this army and in this movement. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's like someone like you uh, whose voice is respected and heard by tens of thousands of people to keep waving that flag. There is a new phenomenon I want to ask you if you have uh, considered. China, the People's Republic of China, has been trying to reduce its population. And for years, they had a one-child rule because abortions were freely available. Chinese families tended to have all the boys they could have rather than daughters. So what happens is right now, there are basically five Chinese males for every three Chinese females. They have been getting over to Africa a great, great deal, and this surplus male population has been going over there, and they're breeding. And now we've got something that I call the Afro-Chin race in China, and it is looking like it's already surpassed the <clears throat> significance of the Afro-American uh ethnic group here in the United States, uh, black folk and white folk here, and over there, black folk and Chinese folk. And somewhere, it looks like, as the U.S. slips from its preeminent fish position in the world due to a number of factors, and the Chinese come up, there's going to be an interesting dichotomy between what African Americans, Afro Americans, or black Americans do versus what afro chins or black Chinese do. <clears throat> and people don't seem to consider the effects of that. The other thing I wanted to get your thoughts about is, as some have said, our so-called black leadership seems to have abdicated its responsibility to black folk and has basically become a staunch set of advocates for another, not ethnic minority, but the LGBTQ crowd, so that we have lost our advocacy where we would otherwise expect to have it. Do you have any thoughts on that? Or am I way out of line in making that observation? I just returned from a two-week tour, my 31st trip uh, to uh, the Pan-African diaspora, um, uh, which stops in Ghana, uh, Senegal, and Johannesburg. Ghana is of particular interest along with Nigeria, which I've been five or six times, and the Chinese are all over the place. In fact, I just read some statistics that within the next decade there will be three hundred million Chinese in Africa. Three hundred million. Um, there is much concern about Africans and, di and the diaspora, about what's going on with the Chinese, not only in terms of population buildup, and that population buildup comes from the projects that the Chinese government funds huge major projects, roads and museums and big buildings and piers for ships to come in, building the infrastructure of 
Africa to, to get out the natural resources of which China must have in order to grow and to continue to develop into the 21st and 22nd century. So there is much discussion, vigorous discussion in Africa about how to manage this and what this potentially could look like and is this a, a new form of neo-colonialism and um, I believe that our African countries and I said this at a speech in the Pan-African Parliament this was a month ago Pan-African Parliament is in Johannesburg uh, that that Africa must be careful about how they manage their natural resources who has access to those resources? What is the price that Africa must pay to provide uh, um, other countries ac access? Right? Is it the price of jobs for Africans? Because curiously, as you, I know you know, that when China spends forty billion dollars on infrastructure in in Africa, that infrastructure is not built by Africans. It's built by Chinese, um, and that is, a, that is a hot button, and that is being vigorously debated and studied uh, on the continent as we speak. Uh, there, are, there are many brilliant African intellectuals on the left of that conversation and some on the right of that conversation, the right being Africa needs to be developed. It does. It has the greatest of natural resources in the world, but it does not have the money to extract, uh, to market, uh, the vertical integration of those resources, the distribution of those resources. Others do, and the price uh, that Africa has to pay uh, is not only the the value of the extraction of those resources, but uh, the uh, lack of jobs that it produces, the lack of jobs that it produces, um, and the small percentage that Africa gets as a result of somebody else extracting their oil. So you have a, the oil, Judge, but I extract it and can refine it. Here's the deal. You get 10%. I get 90%, although it's your oil. It's coming out of your ground. And by the way, I have to have it. So there's much conversation. This is a hotbed of, this is the conversation in certainly most of Sub-Saharan Africa. That problem is yet to be resolved, but it is being vigorously debated and discussed. Um, so you're, you're spot on for bringing it up. Uh, it is um, uh, 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 an issue. Uh, it is a, certainly a 21st century issue. Not only is uh, uh, the, the debate around who gets the natural resources, but the whole technological infrastructure of Africa, too. That has to be developed. So um, that is to be resolved. There are all kinds of tours. I'm sure you've read about them. Return, you know, the door of return and the year of our return. This is the 400th. Uh, yeah, last year was the 400th anniversary. Um, uh, some of the countries are providing citizenship to African Americans. That's slowly but surely uh, happening. Uh, the countries where it was difficult to get visas, like, for example, or Nigeria, uh, it's now easier. You can get a visa. Uh, once you go over there, you can get a visa on the spot So at a low, uh, at a low price. So they're loosening things up. Land is being made available to anybody that wants to repa repatriate, any African American that wants to repatriate to Africa. So they're things happening to attract people of African descent, but they're still not happening on the scale of the Chinese invasion, both in terms of building it and uh, financing the building of those, uh, the, those you know, the infrastructure. Uh, it's still a scale that only China 
is invested in. I mean, there are other countries that are putting money in Africa, but not at the rate and not with the strategy of we will lend you money. Remember, ain't nobody giving anybody any money. We're going to lend you this money. And if you can't pay this back in the, in, in the, in, in the sequence in which we had signed, we own it. And there's a lot of cynical thinking about that because the uh, the bill is very the monthly bill is very large, so it could be and this is the the left or I'm sorry the right thing it could be that we, that Africa is taking more money than it can reasonably pay back. This is would be would remind us of what the French did to the Haitians when they were beaten and kicked out of Haiti. Uh, they asked uh, that the Haitians pay them uh, millions of dollars uh, for the work that they had done while they were colonizing Haiti. And uh, the Haitians agreed to that just to get the French out. And the Haitians have not been developed and basically have been put into bankruptcy trying to pay back what they owed France during the colonization of Haiti by France. French, The French were the most egregious in uh, the colonialized Africa, colon, uh, colonizing about 14 African countries and about $300 billion a year, Judge, comes out of those countries, although they are not colonized any longer formally by France. But the bill that they have to pay for the work that the French did while they were colonized is about $300 billion a year. And they can barely pay that back, and therefore those countries are undeveloped. So I say all that. I don't want to get too caught up in the weeds. This, those who understand what's going on in Africa are concerned, deeply concerned, about the Chinese presence in Africa, the bill that the African countries that are taking this money uh, is creating, uh, and the labor force which is projected, is, is projected, as I said earlier, uh, within uh, a decade to be 300 million Chinese. It's something to worry about. All right, guys, that is the end of part one. There is a part two, so please stay tuned. Dr. Frazier blessed us with two hours, and I cannot compound all of that information into one edit. So meet me down in the comment section. Let's have a discussion about what you learned or gained from part one, all right? And also, please remind me, just in case I forget, to post part two. Probably won't, but never hurts to have a reminder. I hope you're having a great day. I will see you down in the comment section. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, tell a friend who will tell a friend about this broadcast, and please continue to support. All right, here we are, a note from our sponsors. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. Trump is sort of this walking white supremacy symbol. And they see that and they are buoyed. They're like, wow, like this is, this is the guy who is the embodiment of what we wish we were. Donald Trump made people comfortable with not having to be politically correct anymore. That means white folk who want to go on with their racism, their uh, bigotry, their sexism, their homophobia without being challenged. He's playing to people's fears and he's uh, exploiting their fears for his own political ends. And I don't even know that he believes his own rhetoric. He's not trying to give all the jobs in Chicago to people in Tecumseh Galpa. Trump is the best thing we could have because we were bamboozled by the Democrats and the Republicans. Now we see that it's a system based upon the interests of rich white men with property and power, always has been, will not change. When you say something like, make America great again, what does that mean? is not a racist. Trump is about business. And most business people like me want a guy like him in charge. All 
All right, guys, that is the end of the trailer. Please, 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 if you'd like to find out more details, go to Curtis Schoon's website. His website is blackwhiteandbluefilm.com, Black white and blue film.com. Please go to the site, peruse the site, hit a few clickable links because the entire documentary film is available for rent or purchase. Again, that website is black, white and blue film.com. Did you enjoy this audio? We sure hope you did. Today's show is sponsored by my olive leaf. Please visit my olive leaf beers to shop for olive leaf extracts, which will assist your efforts to transform your life. Detox your body, increase your energy, get restful sleep, and rid your body of antiviral, antibacterial, and antifungal properties. Do not delay. Contact the MOL reps today. Please visit myoliveleaf.biz for their full line of olive leaf extracts and Moringa products. Oh yeah, for those of you who would like a personal consultation, please call the MOL reps at 612-567-3263. Also visit their website and social media pages for the latest on sales, new releases, and more. Have a great day. See you in the comments section.